Dr. David Rowe has been intimately involved in the search for a cure for OI for the past 30 years. He and Dr. Byers started out their careers together at the National Institutes of Health, where the first genetic snapshot of OI was seen. We were in a lab at the time, when we were at NIH, where we were studying collagen. And while we were there, uh, a number of people were working in a genetics clinic at John Hopkins, and they happened to bring some tissues and cells from some patients with OI and for the analysis. And lo and behold, there was an abnormality of the collagen that we, no one had ever seen before. And it was the first genetic example of how collagen can uh, be, uh, have an effect on, on people. Both doctors Rowe and Byers left NIH, with Byers going to Seattle where he developed the first test to determine if a person had OI. Meanwhile, Rowe came to Connecticut and began to focus on a cure for OI. The search is not unlike the proverbial needle in a haystack, where the answers lay buried under a mass of genetic information. Just to give you an idea of kind of what the, the problem, the issue is here, this uh, big piece of paper here lines, lines up all the genes that are in the human body. And each line here represents a part of one chromosome and all the genes that are on that chromosome. And if you look at the fine print, there are actually, there, uh, uh, all the chromosomes are laid out. And the one that we're primarily interested in is down here on chromosome 17, which begins right here and goes across and goes across. And I think the gene that we are working on is this little one right here. And it's only one tiny, one little smidging area, one base that is wrong that causes this whole problem out of this entire thing. And so the problem then is, is how are we going to go in and deal with this, just this little tiny, tiny bit of this entire mass that, uh, of, of, of genetic information to make it uh, and to correct it. In Rowe's lab, they search for the ultimate cure by using mice, which have an almost identical genetic footprint to humans. They're trying to correct the defective collagen genes they've implanted in the mice and then take those findings and apply them to patients who have brittle bone disease. It's a process that is still in the theoretical realm, but Dr. Rowe is hopeful his theories are correct and that within these walls they will unravel the OI mystery. Meanwhile, Corone Sturm continues her search for a treatment that will help her son Jojo and she moves one step closer to that reality with a phone call from a local doctor in her home state of Alaska. Hello? From the relative isolation of Fairbanks, Alaska, Caron Sturm has been relentlessly trying to find some treatment for her son Jojo, who is suffering from brittle bone disease. It's been a while since we had this kind of snow. Oh. To date, a successful treatment hasn't been found for him. And then, Caron gets a call from a local doctor who holds out new hope in the form of a therapy just developed. Is that ready to go? Doctor in town had told us about Fosamax, which is used for um, often women with osteoporosis. And we looked into that and it looked like a relatively safe drug to administer. And so we were pretty excited about that. You have to be... a, a, a an aggressive person because you are really your child's advocate and if you don't do it you can't wait for somebody else to you know knock on your door and tell you that they're going to come find a cure for your kid it just doesn't work that way I hope it works I really do it's getting to the point where Jojo has a lot of fractures and nothing seems to be working like it should I dread what our next steps are going to be if we don't find something that will strengthen his long bones. What Caron dreads is having Jojo go through a rotting surgery, an operation about to be performed on a four-year-old girl in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh, we don't know. So, uh, we're going to rod uh, both both femurs. Mm -hmm. That's what we're. That's what the goal will be. 
After examining her x-rays, Dr. Smith determines he will place a thin steel rod through the middle of the femur bones in both Rebecca's legs. The rod about to be inserted is telescoping, which operates similar to the aerial on a car. In this case, as Rebecca's bones grow in length, the rod, fixed at either end, will extend with her growth. That's four fingers. That's four fingers, right. You did good. What are you going to do, do you know? Are you going to go get zippers in your legs? Yeah. What are they going to do? Are they going to straighten your bones out? Yeah. Mm, they're going to straighten them out? Yeah. What are they going to do? What's going to happen after they're straightened out? What did Dad tell you? Are you going to be a ballerina? No. You going to ride a bicycle? Yeah. Yeah. And run through the yard? Are you going to rollerblade? You going to no. rollerblade? Run for the grass. Run for the grass? Then you can run out to the swing set and get in the swing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's just the thought of somebody else has control of, of what our child needs and am I willing to let go and, and let them do that. It's always scary, somebody going under anesthesia. You know, there's always that on, no one sense. Um, what's going on? What's going on while you're not in there paying attention? Somebody actually taking a bone out of her legs and, and cutting the bones or breaking the bones and sticking a rod through. You're, you're putting you're putting her life in somebody else's hands. Of course, when your child's in pain, you feel that pain also. Whoops. Come on, go, go to the door. Come on. Okay, you want to get your kisses and hugs? And we'll ring the bell, let them know we're here. We'll get your hugs. Give me a kiss. You want to come get us a second? Come up here, scooch up. Give me a hug and kiss. And I'll see you when you wake up, okay? Hello, here's Hi. Rebecca. Rebecca's mom. Rebecca yeah. had uh, P.O. Priya. And then we got... Hi, Rebecca. Oh. I'm Kathy. Any last-minute questions? Mom? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, last-minute question, Mom. Need yeah. her drink? The operation is labor-intensive and is expected to take more than four hours. You can look. It's okay. Well, the underlying principle is the bone has to be big enough to, to support the rod. The purpose of the rod is to serve as an internal splint in the bone. And the reason is the bone isn't strong enough to fend for itself. Uh, there's an underlying structural problem with the bone. It's, it's smaller, there's less of it, and also it's, it's more brittle. It, it fails. And so um, the properties of the uh, a rod inside the bone are almost like the, how a rebar functions in a cement building. It provides more tensile strength, uh, whereas the, the bone itself is brittle and, and fails in these patients. Um, so that's the reason. That, and it supports things like uh, having them move more or, or, or even walk on bones that would otherwise uh, fail. The rotting surgery is a slow, painstaking process. The simplicity of the operation does not do justice to the precise manner of the technique. Under the skillful eye and careful steady hand of Dr. Smith, the bone is threaded together in a shish kebab like manner. We cut it in two places. We cut, we, the first cut we made was starting in this fracture and then we removed a little bone above that. And then this, we, we drilled this segment and where that bone, where that um, bend is, that's where we cut a second segment. So we cut this, uh, this femur twice to put the rod in. And she's doing okay. 